Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I obviously think this is the most important issue facing us, and uh, I'm very glad that there's quite a lot of people here who obviously agree. We've got exactly the speakers I think we should have for addressing this issue. From my perspective, we're here primarily to launch the report that's been written by Tom Scott called Facing Down Facebook, but we're also very pleased to have Commissioner King, and he's going to talk about some of these issues more widely, the issues of social media and democracy from the Commission perspective. Uh, Claude will introduce the speakers in due course, but I just wanted to say, by way of opening, um, yeah, how glad I am that we've got the speakers we've got, because I think they're, they're going to have a broad range of areas to talk about and exactly the issues we need to discuss, and then we've got plenty of time for you to come in with your questions at the end. So what we've tried to do with this report and why I commissioned it was to try and pull together into one place a summary of exactly what we know about what Facebook has been up to as a result of the various inquiries that have been carried out. And I'm sure some of you have seen some of that, but it's really quite an overwhelming amount of information and really quite horrifying information as well. Um, you may know, I didn't know this until I actually read the report, that a, a slogan that Facebook used during their early development phase was move fast and break things, and they certainly seem to have lived up to that. It just is rather troubling to think that one of the things they have broken appears to be democracy itself. So we had voter suppression ads during the 2016 US presidential elections. We had propaganda sent to voters during the Brexit campaign. And again, we are not in a position to say whether that influenced the outcome. But with such a small margin, I think that's highly, highly questionable. Um, we had lies spread during the WhatsApp campaign in Brazil, uh, Facebook owned WhatsApp, obviously, which led to a situation where uh, a fascist has been democratically elected with huge implications for us all in terms of uh, environmental protection and the Amazon and so on. So these are vast questions, global questions about democracy and protecting our democracy and making sure our democracy can thrive in the age of social media, which also, of course, offers huge advantages for those of us seeking to communicate in a democracy. I think one of the reasons there's been so much negative uh, coverage and negative response to Facebook itself is that their attitude, once these stories started to come out, has been a very defensive, unhelpful, and I would say complacent one. So, for example, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has refused to attend the committee at Westminster, and although he came here, it was a very sort of controlled session and not very helpful, I think. And often Facebook have sent PR people rather than technical people, rather than Zuckerberg himself and the technical people, and those are the people we really need to hear from. But we're actually hearing from sort of PR people who just try and present a good image. And um, I think that is as f for lawmakers who are really concerned to get to the nitty-gritty of this and to put the right sort of regulation in place. That's, that's unhelpful and also not a good message. And so my conclusion is that Facebook cannot be trusted to reform itself, and we do need to have regulatory action in this area. And we have to have that particularly with a view to the European elections, and also, of course, from a British perspective, if we have a, a second Brexit referendum, then again, we need to make sure that is protected and the same sort of interference can't happen as happened during the first referendum. But of course, we're all aware of the risks that such regulation poses risks to free speech, risks to the open society that we all want to be part of. So I think they're, they're complex questions, they're hugely important questions, and uh, I'm glad there's, a, there's a, a large number of you here today who'll be able to raise questions and join us in debating how we need to take this forward once we get into the question and answer session. But to introduce the speakers and to moderate the, uh, the presentations, I'm going to hand over to Claude Myers, who I'm delighted to say is co-hosting this event with me. Thank you very much, um, Molly, and I'm really happy to um, to co-host this with um, to Molly Scott Cato. Molly has been obviously tenacious on this issue, and um, it, it's a really great thing that we're doing this together. Um, not least because um, it allows us to to also um, bring in. I thought we'd stop doing this coffee thing at the thing. But see, this is a great thing about doing things with greens. It's great branding. You get coffee. There's even like um, buns. Food. Yeah, so great. This is good. Doesn't happen with our group, but I'd love I'd love coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Okay, it's a long time since that's happened to the socialists. Being well looked after is an important part yeah, of this. Molly's the coolest, it's great. <laughs> okay, so, um, it, but it allows us, and, and this is particularly in relation to, to when I introduced the Commissioner, allows us just to, to mention something that, that, that Molly um, alluded to, which is that um, the Parliament, uh, slightly invisibly sometimes, um, has been heavily immersed in the issue of Facebook. It is a profound issue for us. The integrity of elections, which the Commissioner will, will, will be talking about in, in a second, but the whole issue of online and offline uh, solutions and the tools that the European Union is using uh, to deal with Facebook. Um, as Molly said, rightly, Mark Zuckerberg did come to the European Union as opposed to not coming to the, the British House of Commons. It was not a good session for a number of reasons, as she, as she, as she um, um, said just now. Um, but he did come because he knew that the European Union had legislation and tools, cross-border tools, which are quite compelling if used properly, um, both soft law and, and, of course, GDPR, possibly the e-privacy legislation. So that is an extremely important basis on which we then had our hearings. And one of our speakers, Professor David Carroll, gave very compelling evidence and testimony at those hearings. And I want to, again, um, refresh. And one of the good things, Molly, about having this um, joint seminar today is to refresh and re-launch um, kind of all the, the text that we had in those hearings and not lose the evidence that Professor Carroll and others gave at those hearings because it is very difficult to, to challenge um, what Facebook is doing, but we tried to do that in the hearings here last summer in the European Parliament, and we were, were proud to do that. Um, it, has, it is now leading to some action from the Commission and others, and, and we'll hear about that in a second. So that's important to say, and um, of course we can say many other things, but I know I, I now have to now um, introduce the speakers and move on with our session. So first um, in the in the lineup we um, have Commissioner King, uh, Sir Julian King. Um, he's the um, Security Commissioner uh, for the um, Commission of the European Union, and he's particularly concentrated on the tough bit, which is implementing um, some of the, um, or using the tools that we have, uh, particularly to deal with the electoral issues, um, integrity of elections, and how Facebook has, has been dealing with that. But this is really the tough end. Um, and of course, um, it's extremely important that we deal with that now. And he's been working extremely hard on this, um, reporting to our committee. And it will be really interesting now to hear from Commissioner King um, his take on, on where we are um, and what the Commission has been doing. So, Julian, um, please take the floor. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to uh, this morning. Uh, I'm very glad you're doing this. Uh, my different speakers will be approaching these issues from, from different directions, uh, reflecting the work that they're doing, their experience, their expertise. Uh, I, I, without claiming any particular uh, expertise, uh, have been working with colleagues in the Commission to try and deal with the challenge around making our elections a bit more secure. Uh, obviously, with a particular focus on the upcoming European Parliament uh, elections. Uh, it's not that, uh, as I sit here today in front of you, we know that somebody is definitely planning to try and target and interfere with the European parliamentary elections. But uh, if you look at uh, the recent track record uh, across elections in Europe, the US and elsewhere, uh, we have documented cases of uh, interference and attempted, attempted interference. And there is very clearly uh, a risk uh, which is, uh, has different forms. Uh, some of those attempts at interference are more classical uh, cyber attacks and cyber interference, where you try and uh, hack and leak uh, material, where you try and target candidates uh, or their uh, campaigns. There is also, and we've got documented examples of, of that, uh, organised disinformation campaigns. Uh, in the run-up to and during uh, elections, which can seek to interfere and influence the political debate 
uh, around elections. And indeed, there are uh, both of those elements and some of the other things that have happened uh, in various recent elections show that the aim is to try and raise a question mark around confidence in the electoral process. So that even if you don't succeed in some of the activities, if you're able to leave a sort of cloud of doubt and suspicion that eats away at the public confidence in the process and the results, you, you achieve something. Uh, that's the sort of risk that we need to uh, guard against. And we need to guard against it in the context of the European parliamentary elections, uh, recognising that those elections are, uh, are complicated uh, and provide quite a lot of surface if someone is intending to try and uh, seek to interfere with them, because they take place in at least uh, 27 countries, uh, and they take place over a number of days. And the campaigning for those elections has obviously already started. It takes place over quite a long time across a number of countries. So if you want to try and target the process, unfortunately, for the European parliamentary elections, there's lots of surface that you can go after. So against that backdrop, we have been working to try and uh, reduce that surface, build our resilience, make us uh, a harder target, and to promote different ways of working together uh, between the member states, uh, between uh, the different actors, and with the private sector, which in this context means the large uh, social uh, media platforms, to, to build our resilience. Uh, we are working with the parliament uh, and with candidates uh, and political parties here to try and see what we can do to help them to guard against some of the obvious risks. Uh, and I have to say that some of the social media platforms have been very helpful in offering advice to parties and individual candidates. Uh, we're working with the member states who have a responsibility to organize the elections in their jurisdictions. Uh, to bring together a network of experts from the member states uh, who work on organising elections, uh, thinking about the risks of disinformation, uh, thinking about cyber security of electoral processes, and another key element in this, thinking about protection of personal data to guard against abuse of personal data in a political context, for example, for hidden micro-targeting. Uh, and those experts from the different member states are now together in a, a network to, to spread best practice, to learn from each other, to try and raise the bar. Because actually the reality today is that some member states are better prepared than other member states uh, against some of these challenges. Uh, that often reflects their national experience. Some member states' national elections and national processes have been uh, targeted. Uh, and they've drawn some lessons from that. So we want, uh, wherever possible, to share those lessons and that best practice. The other thing that we've got uh, with the member states, uh, which is slightly less advanced, we need to speed up, is a disinformation rapid alert system, whereby member states would nominate contact points to work together to map out, to detect and map out any coordinated disinformation campaign, because We've seen examples uh, in the past where it's not just one story in one media, it's multiple media across a number of countries. And obviously, again, I go back to the context of the European parliamentary elections, that is a risk in, uh, in those elections. So we need to get the member states to uh, set up that network and practice how they would spot such coordinated campaigns and what they would do to alert each other and try and get ahead of that kind of cross-border disinformation campaign. So that work is going on. But a key part of our work, and the part that's most relevant to what we're talking about this morning, um, is our work with the big social media platforms. Uh, we got a first internationally, which is a code which we've agreed with the big social media platforms to try and make progress uh, against the abuse of political speech um, political content and the spread of deliberate uh, disinformation. Uh, and that code 
is uh, something that we've worked up with the platforms as partners. So we agreed with them some of the key areas that needed to be addressed, some of the key risk areas. Then we agreed with them some of the steps that could be taken quickly to try and uh, make it harder to people, for people to spread disinformation and abuse social media platforms in this political space. And now we are holding them to account for how they are getting on in implementing those measures that we uh, agreed with them. So we didn't come up with this and impose it on them. We, in a dialogue, uh, agreed these measures with them. Uh, and we're reporting uh, every month between now and the European parliamentary elections uh, on how we're getting on. And I make absolutely no apology about this. We are using the prospect of the European parliamentary elections, the concerns that um, uh, politicians uh, in this parliament, but also across all of the member states, have about the risk of somebody interfering with those elections to drive this debate, to keep the focus on the big social media platforms and try and drive some progress. The areas that we're addressing are uh, uh, political ads, uh, sponsored content, fake accounts, bots, that non-humans circulating political information, uh, the need for rapid corrections, so if something has been shown to be a piece of disinformation, getting the correct information out quickly, widely, to all those who might have seen the disinformation. All of this subject to increased independent scrutiny. So making sure that uh, the many people who outside of the social media platforms who take an interest in these issues uh, are able to uh, work on uh, the data and the material that the platforms have to try and study what's happened in the past and make sure that we are better prepared to deal with such incidents in the future. We've made some progress, and I want to recognise the progress that we are making, uh, but we've also clearly got a lot further to go, and it's urgent. We need to make progress rapidly if we're going to get these measures in place to have an effect before May's European Parliament uh, elections. So uh, we're here to talk about Facebook. It's one of our key partners, uh, uh, along with Google and Twitter, uh, as the social media platforms, and Mozilla as, a, as, a, as another key stakeholder in, in this field. Uh, and uh, we have already put out a first report, uh, which some of you may have seen. Uh, we'll be putting out a second report uh, next week on what they did in January. I have to say the picture remains patchy. Uh, we have seen some progress, but there's still a long way to go. And one of the things that we're seeing is a different, uh, a different degree of detail in the feedback and the engagement we're getting from the different platforms. So it's a bit invidious to name names, but as we're here, I will name some names. Uh, Google are giving us better detailed quality data on the steps that they are taking. Uh, Facebook still have some way to go. So, uh, for example, fake accounts. Uh, Facebook have, uh, by their own uh, admission, got quite a lot of fake accounts. Uh, and some of those fake accounts are very active in the political space. Now, they've said uh, publicly that, that they're taking down a lot of new fake accounts. And actually, that's right. But there's a, there's a kind of flow and stock problem. They are good at taking down newly created fake accounts. But the number of fake accounts that stay on their site remains very high. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we estimated on the basis of their figures that that was somewhere between 80 and 90 million fake accounts. They then revised their figures and have published new figures that say it's more like 117 million fake accounts. And it might be more than that. So this remains a big problem. And we need to work with them to bear down more effectively on the number of fake accounts, including the number of active fake accounts in uh, the political space. They undertook to uh, work more with fact checkers, independent fact checkers. Uh, and this is very welcome. Uh, it's welcome that they have now engaged with fact-checking partners in eight uh, member states, covering seven of our EU official languages. 
That's great. But there are going to be elections in at least 27 uh, member states. So we need to see this uh, engagement with fact-checkers speeded up. Now, Facebook say, and I understand and have some sympathy for this, that when they uh, engage in a relationship with a fact-checker, it, it's an important relationship for them because they're going to be um, reacting to what the fact-checker says. So they have to have confidence in that relationship. I accept that. But other platforms have got larger networks of fact-checkers. So they need to uh, speed up. Uh, the, key, the key challenge, uh, however, is around transparency, particularly around uh, political adverts. Uh, and and we, have, we have a challenge there. Uh, Facebook have said, you've probably seen some of the publicity, uh, that they will roll out a pan-EU archive for political and issue advertising on the model that they've done in a, in a couple of uh, jurisdictions already. And they'll roll that out for the EU. Now, that is very welcome. <coughs> Uh, however, uh, they've said that this will be available in March. And I'm not sure they mean early March. Uh, they've also said that the performance indicators for uh, the use of this archive, so how accessible it'll be, what kind of things you'll be able to check on it, how transparent it will be, how open to independent scrutiny, uh, will only be available once the service has launched. So then we're into April. Now, this all sounds like it could go a bit faster. Uh, and we would like to encourage them, as we are encouraging the other platforms, to see whether we couldn't uh, speed this up. Uh, we would like to encourage them also to give us more data about what they're doing right now under their existing rules to scrutinize uh, the placement of uh, political ads. For example, uh, what are the number of pages uh, and websites that they're not allowing to run uh, political ads or to use monetization features because those pages or websites have been identified as regularly sharing false news. Other platforms are sharing that information with us, and that is very useful information. Uh, I think it would be great if Facebook were able to share that information with us. So, uh, Facebook are doing more, and I welcome that. They're doing more with their own instruments about how they police their own network. Uh, and I welcome that. But that should not be at the expense of the ability of outside independent scrutiny and outside independent experts also to get engaged in uh, a collective effort to improve how we identify and crack down with disinformation and fake news on sites like Facebook. Uh, that work uh, continues. Uh, we're going to uh, continue to shine a light on the progress that is being made, or in some cases, the progress that still needs to be made, because this is so important. And it is really important that we make progress between now and the European parliamentary elections. Last thing, we have said, and we've been quite transparent about this from the outset, uh, that uh, after the elections, uh, when this code has been uh, in uh, existence for uh, about a year, so in the early autumn, uh, we propose from the Commission side to review overall progress against the objectives of the code of all of the key social media platforms. And we have uh, said that if we're not getting the kind of progress that we need on a voluntary basis, we do not exclude having to look at another approach, uh, a regulatory approach. We didn't jump straight to that approach because we wanted to get going quickly and we wanted to see where we could get to on a voluntary basis and we wanted to make progress before the European parliamentary elections and as others on this panel are even more expert than me, we weren't going to get regulation through and enforce in time to affect that. So we went down the route that, we, that I've just set out. Uh, but if it doesn't deliver enough, fast enough, then we will have to look again.
Thank you very much indeed, uh, Julian. And um, <clears throat> I should say there is a lot more because you've been reporting um, regularly to, to our committee um, and what the Commission is doing. And we rely on the Commission, of course, now to take um, action. And, uh, of course, the big stick of regulation is there. And this has been uh, widely discussed. Um, and I know, and it's particularly important that you are here, and I know you're going to be listening to, to more of the debate, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, so colleagues, um, as Molly had mentioned, um, her office has published um, this report um, called Facing Down Facebook. There's no ambiguity there, it's very clear. Um, and so at the heart of today's um, uh, launch it is the launch of this of this publication um, written by Tom Scott and Tom is here on video link and um, he's going to speak to this publication and give the key findings so um, Tom thank you for being with us and uh, please um, uh, launch your publication which has of course been published by Molly Scott Cato and her team thank you very much Tom. And uh, thank you, Commissioner, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, as Claude says, my name's Tom Scott. I've written and researched this report. I'm a senior lecturer at Falmouth University here in Cornwall, as well as being a freelance writer and researcher. And I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about how I got interested in the whole problem of social media being used to spread disinformation. I use Twitter a lot, and in 2016, I started noticing some very odd-looking accounts on Twitter. They were tweeting support for Brexit, they were retweeting content from leading Brexiters like Nigel Farage, uh, Aaron Banks of Leave.eu, and from various alt-right websites such as Breitbart, and a lot of stuff also from Russian propaganda outlets such as Russia Today, RT. Uh, typically, these accounts were sharing a great deal of fake news, and much of this was designed to stir hatred uh, against immigrants in particular in the UK, in the US, and in other European countries. Very often, they also seem to be promoting various Russian fo foreign policy objectives uh, in the Ukraine, uh, in Crimea, and Syria. And also, of course, to build support for Donald Trump's election campaign. This is old news now. Uh, in 2017, a number of journalists, most importantly, Carol Cadwallader, uh, began to investigate the connections between leading figures of the Brexit campaign, particularly uh, Aaron Banks and his uh, sidekick Andy Wigmore with uh, the Russian state. And uh, I got into various exchanges on Twitter with Andy Wigmore, who is the communications director of Leave.eu. I pointed out to Wigmore that uh, his content was being widely shared by what appeared to be Russian uh, trolls, sock puppets, bots. Uh, he said this was really not very important because his campaign had their own bots in Bristol. This was interesting because it was something that he'd directly denied to the UK Electoral Commission. Um, I immediately screenshotted the tweet in which he admitted this and forwarded it to the Electoral Commission. And uh, I'd like to think that this played a small part in the Commission decided to reopening to reopen its investigation into Leave.eu, its electoral expenses and its use of data. Uh, by this time, Carol Cadwallader was digging deeper into the role that Cambridge Analytica had played in that campaign and into the ways in which Facebook data had been used and abused, of course, to target voters in the UK. And I was also working with Molly on a website that delved a bit deeper into some of the motives of the people who had bankrolled and promoted Brexit. By comparison with Twitter, Facebook is an extremely um, complex and opaque platform. It's far more difficult to spot this kind of malign content being spread in real time or to see who's engaged with it. And despite the efforts of the uh, 
parliamentary DCMS committee, Damien Collins's committee, and journalists like Carol, we still don't know the full extent of the ways in which Facebook data was used to target disinformation and misleading advertising on voters in the UK in that campaign. But it's very clear that this took place on a huge scale. It turns out that Vote Leave, the official uh, Leave campaign, was actually using Facebook to uh, target disinformation on a far bigger scale than Aaron Banks and Leave.eu uh, through a Canadian company, AIQ, which has now become quite well known, which was testing and targeting these ads for it. We've only illustrated one of these so-called dark ads um, in our report, which carried a completely false message. The message was that the EU stops us from protecting polar bears, uh, a ridiculous um, falsity. But there were literally hundreds of thousands of other ads, uh, each of them calibrated very carefully to appeal to the identified susceptibility of particularly uh, identified groups, narrowly uh, identified groups, target audiences selected using Facebook data. It's still not clear um, whether AIQ were using the same data set which had been gathered and processed by Alexander Kogan for Cambridge Analytica, sold to them. But it seems extremely likely that it was, as well as various other dubiously obtained data. It was effectively a sister company of Cambridge Analytica, and it was set up expressly to work with it. And there are many other areas of this story which are still extremely murky, such as the role of Palantir, for example. That's the big data company set up by a very early Facebook investor, um, Peter Thiel. He, uh, I think he's still a Facebook board member. If not, he has been until very recently. Uh, we know from Christopher Wiley, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, that Palantir staff were frequent visitors at Cambridge Analytica's offices in Britain. We still don't know exactly what they were doing there. We don't know what the relationship between the two companies was exactly, or what data was exchanged between them. But what is clear is that it's almost inconceivable that the volume of disinformation did not have a significant impact on the result of that referendum in the UK. Uh, we know from Dominic Cummings, the campaign director of, Leave. of Vote Leave, that around 1.5 billion ads were targeted on UK voters in the very last days of that referendum campaign. Um, and there's, of course, a reason why Vote Leave decided to spend a very large part of its budget, in fact, to illegally overspend uh, on these ads. And that's because they're highly effective. So what we have here is the most important vote in the UK, probably since 1945, critically impacted by the use of disinformation and misleading advertising. Uh, all of this facilitated by Facebook and AIQ, and all taking place largely under the radar of the electoral regulator. And we know that the UK is very far from being the only country in which this has happened. So that was really the starting point for this report. How has this been allowed to happen, and how can it be prevented from happening again? And answering those questions really meant looking at the whole way in which Facebook's business model is set up and how it operates, and how it's come to occupy what's effectively a monopoly or quasi-monopoly position in the social media sphere. I hope that the history section of the report does this quite effectively and brings out the many ways in which Facebook has misled or simply lied to regulators and the public about the manifold abuses of data that it's facilitated. And it's quite clear, I hope from this, that Facebook absolutely cannot be trusted to regulate itself. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, what the Commissioner has just told us about working with tech platforms, but I think in the case of Facebook, it's really a triumph of hope over experience to expect that Facebook is going to uh, deal with this, these problems honestly and effectively from what we know about their history. So what can be done? 
Well, many of our proposals actually align quite closely with those of other recent reports, and in particular the excellent DCMS Committee report from the UK House of Commons published on Monday. We absolutely agree with that report that Facebook needs to be held accountable for the information or the disinformation that its algorithms channel towards Facebook users in the same way as a publisher is held accountable. Uh, we also fully agree on the need for far greater transparency and user control over political advertising on that platform. Facebook, as the Commissioner has been describing, uh, has been making some efforts in this direction, but these are absolutely not sufficient. Uh, there's plenty of evidence that some of the same actors uh, that were deluging users with dark ads in 2016 are doing this again, uh, this time to promote the hardest possible Brexit. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of a group called Britain's Future, which is putting out um, thousands and thousands of ads targeting these on UK voters. Uh, they are registered as political advertisers on Facebook, but it's completely unclear who is behind this organisation and who is paying for these ads. So it's really not good enough, the steps that Facebook has taken so far. And there are several other areas in which we think that the DCMS report uh, perhaps is a little bit vague or perhaps doesn't go quite far enough. And one of these is the role of the EU. And it's quite clear to us that GDPR represents by far the most effective effort yet, yet taken by regulators anywhere to curb the abuses of personal data that Facebook has facilitated. And it's particularly, as the Commissioner has explained, it's very urgent to acknowledge this um, ahead of the, the upcoming elections in Europe, but also from a British perspective, as the UK teeters on the brink of Brexit, uh, a no-deal Brexit throws the UK's position in relation to GDPR into question. And although the UK government has said it will remain aligned to GDPR in the immediate future, uh, it hasn't given any long-term commitment to do this. And the fact that Facebook operates across multiple jurisdictions that's another reason why we stress the absolutely crucial need for international alignment on regulation. We think GDPR should be used as a model, in fact, uh, not just by the UK, but by any other country which is considering better regulation of Facebook and other tech giants. And this would make it far easier to hold Facebook to account across borders, across multiple jurisdictions. As we know, data crosses borders uh, with extreme speed and extreme ease, and Facebook has already been moving some of its data uh, out of particular jurisdictions, apparently in order to uh, avoid uh, tighter regulation in those. Uh, like us, the DCMS report published on Monday discusses the need for a code of practice for social media, uh, for social media platforms. We see the code of practice on disinformation that the Commissioner has just been describing as a very important step forward. Um, the beginnings of what should be an uh, important step forward at least. But at present, this is a self-assessment system. And it's worded in a way that makes adherence to the code desirable rather than necessary. And I hope that the report has made very clear that it's absolutely not sufficient to rely on Facebook regulating itself. This simply isn't going to happen based on what we know about its history. It's also very concerning, I think, that various existing fake Facebook policies on fake news, on uh, political advertising and misrepresentation are held up as examples of best practice. So we think adherence to a much more tightly worded code should be a legal requirement for social media firms uh, with heavy penalties for any breaches and that a tightened up code should be used like GDPR as the basis for regulation by countries outside the EU also. And in fact, adherence to such a code, uh, a regulatory code, 
could be made a prerequisite for such companies' license to operate in uh, different countries across the world. One particular area in which we think the code really needs to be tightened up is on identity verification and automated posts by non-human agents. Um, the Commissioner has just told us that uh, fake identities are still a massive problem on Facebook, despite what the company says are efforts to uh, counteract this. And opaque or fake identities make it extremely hard to tackle disinformation online. Um, Facebook really has only just scratched the surface of this, I think. We are recommending that identity verification be required for all user accounts and that any organisational pages should be linked to legally founded um, found, uh, organisations or associations with responsible named people behind them. Uh, one other key area of our proposals that I'd like to highlight relates to Facebook's basic business model and its quasi-monopoly position. We hope that the report has made clear that Facebook has routinely treated users of its platform essentially as inventory. That's a word that was used by one Facebook executive to describe Facebook users. In other words, as commodities to be packaged up and sold to the highest bidder. And this to us is absolutely the core of the problem. Users of Facebook uh, create Tom, the vast bulk Tom, of the Tom, value. Tom, may I interrupt? Uh, Tom, sure. sorry, it's very rude interrupting a video uh, link because that's even ruder than in person. But I um, was just, um, just wondering because we wanted to keep some time for questions as well and um, we were kind of overrunning on time. Yes, that's uh, absolutely so, fine. So I'm just wondering, so because I'll, 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 questions I'll, to you I'll, as well, you know, so absolutely. I'm wondering if you could uh, please start to conclude and then if we all keep keep to then to 10 minutes, um, I know people will, might have questions for, for you and for the other speakers, so. Um, that's absolutely fine. Because the commissioner um, will be I going at 11.15, 11 uh, so 11.30. Thank you. We think that Facebook users need to be represented at the highest level of the company uh, on the board. We've also made a rather radical proposal, which is that Facebook could possibly offer users of the company shares in Facebook. Uh, finally, I'd just like to emphasise that despite all of the criticism in our report, we don't see social media as an unmitigated evil. We think it can and should be a force for positive good in the world and that there are ways in which this can be made more likely to happen, which the report describes. Thanks. Tom, thank you very much indeed. I hope I wasn't being rude in the Not interruption. It was a brilliant oh, presentation. Sorry, carrying on for too long. That very calm sentence, you can't expect Facebook to regulate itself, was really the most profound for me because that's really what the searing statement that came out of our hearings and I think very eloquently um, set down by you as well and of course in the publication. Thank you very much indeed. And um, as we said about the hearings, we had um, really brilliant testimony from Professor David Carroll um, during those hearings, uh, also from Carroll and from other um, really um, compelling um, uh, uh, individuals and I don't want that to be lost and I'm really delighted then that Molly and her team were able to invite Professor David Carroll today um, to give um, to give his take again uh, to, to another parliamentary um, grouping here. Um, so without further ado and because we're running um, a bit out of time I want to ask Professor Carroll to give um, uh, his take and uh, for 10 minutes if he can uh, so that we can get some questions in as well. Thank you. So, Professor Carroll. Thank you very much, Claude and Molly, for inviting me to this. I'm c coming to you from an undisclosed, undisclosed location in upstate New York this morning. Um, but I wanted to uh, just sort of give a few comments around uh, my work with C Cambridge Analytica and the scam. Uh, just comment on some developments in the United States uh, since I appeared uh, last summer, um, some specific developments in the ongoing SCL elections legal challenge, some thoughts on the elections in 2019 and beyond, and maybe time for a summarizing comment. So um, I think for me at this point, 
I see the Cambridge Analytica story as one that gives us an object to understand the business models of multiple industries overlapping, that there are many Cambridge Analyticas in the world. It's important to focus on one because it serves as a canary in the coal mine of a much larger industry and sort of the way that legitimate and illegitimate industries o overlap in the business of influence in elections. And then the other way that Cambridge Analytica is useful to us now is that it can serve as a litmus test for how future responses uh, can be evaluated. That is, could we prevent another Cambridge Analytica scenario? And if our proposals are failing to do so, that's a simple way to sort of pre-evaluate them. But let me just give us some um, sort of recent observations of how things are changing in the United States since last summer. So um, an important thing is that the Washington, D.C. Attorney General has filed a lawsuit against Facebook. And there are some really tough questions asked in that complaint. In particular, it zeroes in on something that hasn't gotten a lot of discussion and debate, and that is the conduct between Facebook and Cambridge Analytica at both the front and the back end of the scandal. That is, to allow the data to be illicitly harvested, and then to work with that company again, sitting side by side in San Antonio and uploading illicit voter data back into Facebook used for micro-targeting. The D.C. Attorney General is sort of the first to ask that question in the United States in a public forum. Uh, the other big development is that the, when I was in Brussels uh, last summer to give my uh, statement and evidence, uh, a, a documentary crew was following me, and that scene made it into the movie called The Great Hack, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival last uh, month, and you can be happy that the e EU Parliament is prominently featured, as well as the DCMS com committee. But there's important evidence and revelations in this documentary that will be on Netflix later in the year, including more evidence that Facebook data was still being used by Cambridge Analytica long after it claimed and certified that it had deleted it. And so more proof that we were receiving untrue statements from them. Um, the other important news is that the Federal Trade Commission and Facebook are negotiating a mega fine, potentially in the billions. But the question is, will it change anything materially in the company? That it is like, there, we don't even have to wait for a GDPR level fine. That the US may fine Facebook GDPR levels, and we'll see if it has any effect. Another important development that relates to my comments last summer before the parliament was I'm glad I mentioned the company Psy Group in my statement because an important New Yorker article was published uh, last week which goes deeper into the story of these other firms that are related to firms like SCL and Cambridge Analytica that actually practice in what we would call troll farm activity, uh, building fake sites and fake accounts and spreading disinformation and hired and working for campaigns, in, in fact, or for donors of ca campaigns. These are important new problems that um, I was audacious to say last summer, but now I'm glad I did. Um, the uh, DCNS report that, um, that was already mentioned uh, does cross over deeply into the U.S. and Canada, uh, and the details and concerns about uh, when executives at Facebook knew what when uh, are detailed in the report, and it's important for the EU Parliament to consider to press on the executives of when they knew what when and have they deceived uh, lawmakers on the timeline, or worse, was Zuckerberg shielded from important information, which would represent dysfunction and mismanagement at the company. Um, the other important thing that um, the DCMS report uh, references is the d detailed use of the custom audiences feature of Facebook, one that merits more critique and scrutiny because it enables the direct voter micro-targeting and it's also a feature that users cannot opt out of. They are forced to be custom audience targeted. Um, and it's, um, that, that is a big problem. 
And related to that, Facebook, I think, is now more than a year late in delivering a global privacy center to redesign its controls to claim to be GDPR compliant. Sheryl Sandberg promised this in Brussels more than a year ago, and the main controls for Facebook have yet to be redesigned to be GDPR compliant. So in many ways, I doubt Facebook is GDPR compliant to this day. And then the last update on um, what's going on in the U.S., uh, r rumors that the Mueller report will be concluding, and the question remains, will Cambridge Analytica play a part in the final uh, Mueller report? There's plenty of indications that it very well could, which could shift again our perception of what this co company is and did. Um, one more, um, now I'll shift to just talking about some developments in my own personal legal challenge against the co companies in the UK. Uh, it's sort of shifted from a data protection challenge to an insolvency challenge. And on the 18th of March in the High Court, there'll be a hearing where the, the joint administrators will be challenged uh, as to their attempt to liquidate the company. There are many concerns articulated in the DCMS report, and we were bringing additional ones to court. Uh, and we may be trying to get closer to recovering our voter data, but there's still much more work to do. And it's so incredible to think about all this work that we're doing to clean up Facebook's mess. And uh, they haven't been helping at all. In fact, they're now appealing their um, punishments. Uh, some final thoughts on your thinking on the elections in 2019 and beyond, as we are now also in election season in the United States for 2020. Um, one thing that we, we want to think about is how muscular data protection enforcement has a deterrent effect and that um, more re regulatory actions will try to de 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 deter bad actors from participating. This is something that the United States does not be benefit from and the EU benefits from, so it's an important tool to wield. Um, we will may maybe feel the effects of snuffing out actors like the Internet Research Agency, Cambridge Analytica, Psy Group, but realize that others are looking in the shadows because we still see the same things. Um, we also need can look at the effects of popular awareness this time. Um, and we can evaluate some political science research that indicates that the effects of online dis disinformation is concentrated at the margins and has um, not so much effect at the whole and that also there are age indications that certain age groups are more susceptible to it than others. These can be evaluated as we go into the future elections. But the key thing is that the platforms have still so much to do. A recent report that came out of the University of Iowa showed that Twitter is acting slowly on shutting down violating APIs. The researchers were able to create an algorithm that could predict which API apps that were autom generating automated Twitter accounts would be shut down for violating policy. And so the fact that the researchers could predict which ones would be shut down, often months in advance of Twitter actually doing it, it shows that Twitter can do much more to limit the, the abuse of its own platform. And it shows that academics are developing new techniques to hold the platforms accountable, even when they don't have access to the necessary data, and that algorithms are being used to regulate other algorithms. Um, but my, the basic way I would s summarize the problem that we are experiencing in the United States and, and around the world related to voter targeting as an industry connected to a dirty influence in industry, is that voters must choose candidates, not the other way around. And ultimately, I think this is a simple expression to, to say that the business model of micro-targeting and the business practices of the influence industry are essentially anti-democratic because they try to select voters for candidates. And that's fundamentally not how democracy is supposed to work. So the other thing to sum summarize basically is that Zuckerberg has shown us that no one person should have so much concentrated power about anything, and that Facebook is essentially an, an autocracy, and Zuckerberg styles himself as an emperor. And so it's not credible that an undemocratic structure like Facebook could promote democracy while being so supremely undemocratic itself. So the question is really, can we imagine a world without Facebook? And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, um, David. And 
Um, Molly, did you want to take any questions now, do you think, before um, we, we come to do, Dr. Bryant? What do, what do you think, Dr. Bryant? It's just, yeah. just I'm, I'm conscious that the Commissioner... On, carry on, carry on. Would you have time yeah, there? Yeah. So, so we go straight to Emma. Sure, okay, sure. Okay. Thank you again, David, and sorry. So, so Dr. Emma Bryant now is going to share her exp um, expertise and research on the topic with us. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bryant, and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as a scholar researching political communication, um, I've studied propaganda for about 15 years, uh, including SCL for my last book, over about 11 years. On uh, the 27th of February 2018, I watched in horror as Cambridge Analytica CEO Alexander Nix told the British Parliament uh, lie after lie. He said he'd had no contact with WikiLeaks, and I'd been told the exact opposite by his business partner only a few months before. Executives from CA and their parent company, SCL Group, uh, told me in interviews for my new book how unethical their companies were. It was almost a badge of honour. Um, anyone holding such information about such practices affecting millions of people has an ethical obligation to cooperate with the inquiries. So I gave uh, what I had to the British Parliament, the Electoral Commission and the ICO uh, in last spring. Um, it revealed the relationships between these different companies, including also, um, more recently, um, approaches by uh, Aaron Banks to Steve Bannon about um, possible US funding of Brexit. Um, the Parliament published my evidence, um, including off-the-record uh, quotes from uh, Nigel Oakes, the CEO of SCL Group. I'm going to play now um, the um, first of my clips discussing how their Brexit narrative um, in the press actually was a good thing for driving up unethical business for them. Uh, this, is what's in, this is what has encouraged people to still come to us. You know, we, we are still... You know, I've got, the, I've got a Swedish contingent business unit coming to on Tuesday. They're bringing over 37 representatives to come and talk to us about... Well, we just wouldn't be on the radar if we hadn't been in the thing. And you can imagine on the politics side, you know, when people say, oh, well, these guys, you know, they, they, they've got some pretty unethical ways of achieving their results. Well, to the average president... And, no. Well, that's what we need. We're going to lose another election. So, you know, we, we have to play a very delicate line as well okay. about what, you know, the people coming to us are not ethical. Yeah. They're not saying we want to do this in the most, you know, Kenyatta and whatever. Yeah. You know, he's, he's saying that, that I mean, frequently people come to us and say, we've got so many dirty tricks against us, we now need to know the dirty tricks to go back or... We need to know how to counter the dirty tricks, and you guys seem to know how to do it. I mean, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, just as and if anything, in some circumstances, the stuff that's being talked about in the media at the moment will sell. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. You know, so, um, it's, um, I mean, no company's whiter than white, but... Back on the record? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. It's just that I, I can't... Yeah, I, I'm very, it was just that bit about yeah, him that yeah, you yeah. Okay. But, um, Oak still runs SCL Insights, which survived all the bankruptcies, and, has, and he still has not testified. Companies like SCL uh, are, um, uh, uh, that are producing the ads, not just those funding them and commissioning them, uh, need to be identifiable through uh, the new audits that are being um, put into place and registries. And their company connections also need to be tracked. Oakes discussed unethical campaigns that were provoking violence with the same blasé attitude somebody might use to talk about sneaking home stationary from the office. So it was normal for him. Those I interviewed were talking based on assumed shared knowledge of the way that uh, the influence industry works. Oakes saw the dark side of the business as just lucrative negative externalities in an industry he believed in. You make cars, you belch out fumes. Well, we can legislate for cleaner air. And this influence industry is entirely unregulated at the moment. And these, by the way, are the people who are now going to be tackling our information, uh, disinformation uh, efforts. So we need to be regulating those companies too. And it's externalities 
that have far-reaching consequences and potential for our future, particularly as they are unequally felt and they obscure, mislead and make it harder to tackle other complex international problems. As I'll explain, we've incentivized not just Facebook, but also an influence industry that developed with it. And um, as it as it has, um, and international solutions to this are required. These must include, for example, changing how NATO and our co governments oversee information warfare. Unethical companies will exist for as long as there is a market for them. Explosive growth of social media like Facebook opened the door to big, big data analytics, psychographics, techniques of surveillant advertising. But SCL drew also on defense-derived methodologies, following high-level security clearance and partnership with DARPA and Britain's DSTL. The uh, Cambridge Analytica were able to develop a surveillance and coercive influence capability for expansion in commercial and political work. Now, that's bad enough, but they did this while SCL was providing similar methods for Western government's national security. What's not been fully appreciated even now is how national security policy has incentivized companies like SCL's business model. Um, they developed a globally expanding network model of obscured companies, surveillant, uh, data-driven propaganda for sale. And it seems likely that taking only ethical contacts would have disadvantaged their growth. They wouldn't have been able to offer so competitive a project, not even to our, our governments. They're seen as offering useful services that governments don't have in-house. And at the moment, there's a lack of alternatives to hiring these kinds of influence industry companies. Government contracts go to companies who are quick to deploy and already prepared uh, with experience, contacts, data and resources. You need the edge to compete. So how does one obtain this? Well, with SCL, it was commercial and political work, some legitimate, some nefarious. Our governments didn't and don't ask enough questions. Government needs, uh, the, most experienced needs the most experienced operator in whatever region it deploys in. Uh, maybe no one appreciated just how bad SCL were, but they should have and they must in future. Um, if we don't change our policies and um, reporting mechanisms, uh, ensuring transparency of the company networks, um, which, by the way, Facebook and platforms can aid in also, and, give, uh, and we need to give strong oversight in NATO government contracting and introduce licensing or regulation in the actual influence industry as well. Um, to mirror the work that we're doing with the platforms across Europe, we will continually perpetuate the SCL problem. Transparency alone is not enough. As evidenced by Nigel Oakes, notoriety can actually drive up business. Blatant abuses should be met with real penalties and fines that hurt that industry. Um, the individuals should be struck off and not be appearing again in new entities working for our governments or in their political campaigns. Um, registers need to make sure that they protect this. Um, this is a dangerous business model for Western democracy. As shown by SCL, it plays a role in destabilizing fragile, fragile democracies in the global south, heightening inequalities with potential impacts on local economies, migration flows, and so on, which can further be exploited by the far-right propaganda in the West. The business model makes our security and our elections vulnerable, even as we fight disinformation. We saw this in SCL when they were working for NATO, supposedly countering Russia. Cambridge Analytica preparing a proposal to work with the FSB-connected company Lukoil at the same time. And AIQ, of course, were developing an app for a party in Ukraine that again raises uh, problems with the stance on Russia. Our governments kept using this contractor at a time uh, when I know that they were aware of a leak. It's not clear to me whether concerns about SCL in 2015 were communicated across NATO countries. The, the lack of transparency and oversight um, to, in, combat, in the way that we combat our foreign threats is counterproductive to our safety, given this example, and repeatedly creates fodder to be used by foreign actors in their propaganda attacking the West. It's not just about data misuse, it's about major security risks. 
Nigel Oakes, who ran the defence work for SCL, called their dabbling in the dark side, which grew to imbalance the company toward that kind of work playing a very delicate line in the clip you heard. We've seen here there's nothing delicate in how SCL played that line, from entrapment and blackmail to setting up shell entities to evade the law, collaborating with hackers, citizenship by investment schemes, and of course the massive data misuse for driving voter suppression and hate-filled false and divisive messaging. Methods that were blunt, brutal and frequently exploitative. He happily admitted to me uh, that they were deploying techniques modelled on Hitler for Trump. As you rightly say, it's that the things that resonate, sometimes to, to attack the other group and know that you're going to lose them, yeah. it's going to reinforce and resonate your group, which is why, yeah. you know, Hitler, I'm going to be very careful about saying, so I must never promise to say this off the record, but of course Hitler okay. attacked the Jews yeah. because he didn't have a problem with the Jews at all. But the people didn't like the Jews, yeah. and so if the people still, yeah, yeah, he could just use them to say, so he just leveraged an artificial enemy. Well, this is exactly what Trump did. He leveraged a Muslim. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, yeah. Yeah, that, it was a real enemy. ISIS is a, yeah. but how big a threat is ISIS really to America? Yeah. You know, really. Yeah. I mean, we're still talking about 9-11. 9-11 okay. well, is a long time ago. Yeah. Because also, you know... I Rather than playing a delicate line with pro propaganda's morality, to obscure the dark side of the industry was the de delicate art artistry. It was in the machinations that were obscuring this from us. In order to enable continued expansion whilst ensuring the credibility of a more legitimate veneer, responses should involve cooperative global solutions, transparency, large penalties. It was good to see the UK Parliament's report recognise the importance of my proposals on regulating that industry, not just dealing with the platforms, but this will require an audit of the governance of military information operations, oversight, and whether reliance on private sector uh, companies ra raises serious implications for security. Also, how do we address those conflicts of interest? It should be very uh, transparent auditing. This will need to be part of a series of reforms, including greater cooperation and communication between countries and reporting and scrutiny. Um, okay, okay, sure. Um, we have no way at the moment to really know whether other similar shady networks of companies exist behind the government co contractors that we are working with today. We must enable transparency, and this needs to change, as we incentivize reporting and whistleblowing. Um, if you want to work in politics, networks uh, of companies should also be listed and transparent. And I will wrap up very quickly Thank there. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. It's just okay. so we can get some questions in as well before the Commissioner leaves. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, so, thank you to all of our speakers, in fact. Molly, we're going to... Um, please, please, you, please, you go ahead. Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like to share that uh, expression of thanks. It was a really fascinating... Uh, fascinating speakers, I mean, sort of descending from the very uh, sensible partnership approach to the rather horrifying um, presentation of what's actually going on in the industry. And I think as lawmakers, we need to find some kind of balance between those two. Um, so the commissioner has to leave us very quickly. So I'm going to ask for three quick questions. Uh, and if you can express them rapidly, then there's more chance of them being answered. So. Questions to the Commissioner first, because he has to leave, and then we can move into a more general discussion after that. So who would like to ask Commissioner Qu King something? I'm always up for questions. Go on. Go for it, Julie. OK. And Commissioner King and I know each other because we're both working on the, um, uh, on the proposal for a uh, 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 new law on preventing the dissemination of terrorism content online, which is not what we're talking about today, but obviously there are some <coughs> parallels. I think it's really important that today we're talking about safeguarding democracy. Um, and um, it's quite clear that our democracy has been hijacked, in fact, and that elections that have happened over the past few years um, in fact, are probably not an expression of the will of the people. And I don't want just for us to think about how we can make things better in the future. 
and I know Molly, you've done, we've signed, we've co-signed letters um, about the illegality of um, the uh, bre the referendum um, players, uh, the campaign in the UK. Um, but I think, it, yes, it's important that we learn from the past, but I think we've got to be in a situation where we challenge this ridiculous idea that Brexit is the will of the people. Um, and I have been really shocked at how little <coughs> the media are interested in telling the story um, about how our democracy is broken. And I do want to draw attention, actually, to two documents which I would love people to take today. One is by Robert C. Palmer, Dr. Robert C. Palmer. It's about the legal loophole that defies democracy in Britain. And another is the Brexit Files 2, and it's Sue Wilson versus the Prime Minister. It's a case that's actually being heard today in the UK, in, at, the, uh, at the High Court. Sue Wilson is an, a British expat living in Spain, and she's taking the Prime Minister to court, OK? So there's a lot of things going on. So I want to know, um, really, about how we can look at what has gone wrong in the past, not just how we can make things better for the future. And I partly say this because I was an election observer in Kenya, so I know about how all this stuff also affected the elections in Kenya. Kenya, and in Kenya, the Supreme Court annulled the election. So that is a fragile democracy that did something very, very brave. Now, why aren't we doing that? Well, could, would you both like to address that? I suppose, given that we've got mostly British speakers here, it's not surprising that Brexit was going to come up at some stage. But perhaps I could ask our, our two speakers here if they would like to respond to that in any way. Commissioner? Well, I, I'll pick up various things that were said. But the first thing I want to say is that... Uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that there are other things underway which are relevant to addressing some of the harms that uh, we see from abuse of social media. Uh, I agree with those who've said that you know, we can't just have a dark view of social media. There is, there is lots of positive that comes out as well, but there are clearly harms, and uh, those harms need to be addressed. One set of harms is to do with illegal content, uh, child sexual exploitation content. And as you know, from the Commission's point of view, we proposed uh, regulation, legislation uh, around addressing terrorist content. That's where there's an agreement across different countries, across society, I hope, that certain defined content is illegal and you are it's legitimate to, to target that content and seek to take measures against it. That's not what we're proposing in the context of the fight against disinformation. And I just wanted to, to make that contrast, because in the fight against disinformation, we're not suggesting that uh, anyone, uh, not us, not uh, public authorities in member states, still less, uh, private companies should be judging whether something is true or false. But we are saying uh, that you can do better at shining a light on the origin, the source of material, that you can require greater transparency about the provenance of the material that we are seeing in order to allow people to have a more... Uh, clearer, more critical view of the context of the material that they are seeing. At the moment, we're trying to pursue that through the voluntary code, uh, but we have made clear that if we can't get enough progress, then we do not e exclude looking to do something beyond that, including something uh, regulatory. But that regulation would not be trying to determine the nature of individual pieces of political content, because that is, we think, very difficult to do without going down a slippery slope of, of censorship, which the Commission is absolutely not going to propose. Uh, but we can set rules around transparency. So uh, I'm very glad that we're having this discussion. I'm glad we put it in the context of wider, wider harms and the need to take different targeted measures against those harms. Uh, I think we do try and learn from the past. We've tried to learn from uh, the experience that we've mapped out in a number of elections and a number of other democratic uh, processes to better equip ourselves to stop repeats in the future. 
uh, to try and tackle some of the things that have been talked about uh, this morning. Uh, I, I don't represent, as you know, uh, the British authorities. Uh, I stopped doing that when I started this job. Uh, so I don't want to comment on what the British government might or might not have done, might have done otherwise. Uh, I do want to salute, as um, uh, an independent observer, uh, the robust nature of the debate about this in the UK, the inquiries that have been done in the UK, and the fact that some people are taking it through the courts. I think that that is something that we can look at with a certain amount of, um, uh, uh, with a positive view. Thank you very much. And I think you have to leave now, is that right? Well, I could, uh, one more. If you one, one more? OK, you're in time. Catherine Mathieu, I'm a German journalist. I have a question for you. Um, do you think there is enough awareness of all those problems now that we are um, a couple of weeks, in fact, uh, before the European elections? And probably this is still going on. It's going on in this right moment. Do you, th do you feel that there is enough awareness at the, at the member states to tackle this? Well, that's... That's what we're trying to manage, promote, support. Uh, I do think that there is more awareness now than there has been in the past. Uh, there's more engagement from civil society, from uh, public authorities in the member states, and uh, certainly uh, across the European Parliament uh, in trying to raise awareness around these issues and find different ways of tackling them. Do I think that we're doing enough? Well, actually, I'm not sure we are yet. Uh, are we doing what we can? Well, I think that we are trying very hard to address uh, these issues. Can we promise that there will be no uh, disinformation activity around the European parliamentary elections, that we'll be able to uh, detect and counter any attempted disinformation around the European parliamentary elections? Well, you can never give a 100% guarantee. Uh, but just because you can't give a 100% guarantee doesn't mean, in my view, that you can't and shouldn't make an effort to close down the space in which those who might be seeking to pursue disinformation can act. And I think we are making progress in closing down that space. We are raising the bar. We are making it harder. Uh, so that is my honest assessment of where, where things are today. Uh, and uh, I really do hope that we don't wake up after the European parliamentary elections and see things uh, that have happened that we could have done something about in advance. Thank you very much, Commissioner King. It's, it's been great to have you here, and I really appreciate the work you're doing on the code, and maybe we'll end up working together on regulation. Who knows? Um, Thank you, Claude. Thank you for co-hosting with me, and thank you for all the work you did with those fantastic inquiries on the Libe Committee, which was really an important part of this whole process. So um, we're now going to move on to have uh, a discussion between ourselves, half an hour of question and answer, interaction with the other speakers, and uh, I think we can go into more depth now about exactly what the problems are. We have some people who've really studied this issue in detail and have detailed knowledge about the various players, so do feel free to use this opportunity to find out more and to, to let them share their knowledge with us. And I would just say to all the journalists in the room, it amazes me that we didn't have people sort of queuing down, the, queuing down the street. And I've been to similar events in Brussels where people sort of, the, the theme of the event is, are we destroy, is social media destroying global democracy? And there's like 25 people in the room. And so, you know, if you are a, a journalist or if you're a person that shares this information, I think it's, it's helpful to reflect on why that's happening. And to me, part of the issue is, it's just too big. It feels too big. So we've, we've produced this report precisely for that reason, to try and make the information more accessible so that we can bring more people into this discussion because we need, to, we, we need everybody to be focused on defending democracy. Democracy is under attack from social media. It's also under attack from the far right, and these things are interconnected. So uh, you know, if you're a media person, I'm glad you're here. Please share this with your friends. Let's try and make this more of a public debate. Let's share it more widely. And particularly if you have the 
academic and intellectual knowledge about the detail, please do your very best to share that in a way that doesn't put people off, because I think that's the other reason people don't engage. It feels techy and difficult, and so people sort of just put that intellectual wall up. But we all need to know about this, and we all need to be talking about it more. So um, I've got a question over there. Perhaps you could introduce yourself before you ask your question. Now we've got a bit more time. Of course. Thank you. My name is Naya Benson. I'm a policy analyst at the European uh, Parliamentary Research Service. I have two questions. Maybe I should start with one and then uh, wait <coughs> until it's my turn again. Or would you like both of the questions? Okay. Um, speaking of Kenya, we've seen that some countries are less of, have priority for Facebook than others. Ukraine and Myanmar are other examples. And with the EU's increasing pressure on the online platforms to meet the commitments of the code of practice, um, it's probably fair to say, I think, that we will see the best imaginable behavior of online platforms in the coming months. Uh, do you think that what the Commission decides to do when it takes stock uh, in October 2019 will become a global golden standard, just as the uh, GDPR has become? That's the first question. The second question is, um, uh, Professor Carroll, you said, can we imagine a world without Facebook? Um, online platforms currently form the environment where our public debate is taking place. And this is where voters not only express their opinions, but also form their opinions. Can Europe create a realistic, viable alternative based on ethical principles? Thank you for that question. I mean, there's nobody left now to respond from the European institutions apart from me, and I don't actually work in this area of regulation. But I, I would say that... Um, I think, uh, as usual, um, the Commission takes a partnership approach. We all try to work more or less in partnership with powerful corporations. And obviously, as Greens in the European Parliament, we're probably the most sceptical about corporations. And so um, I think we're going to move towards a situation in the next mandate. I, I, we haven't got time to do anything before the European elections, and that makes us all very nervous. But I think before the next mandate, we will be... Um, realising that we have to take regulatory action and make this code of conduct mandatory. And um, so I expect that to happen fairly soon after MEPs return. Now, whether that will have an impact right across the world, I think, um, I think like GDPR, we can set the standard in terms of lawmaking, and then we have to rely on other countries to reach that standard. And also, uh, of course, it's about implementation and enforcement and sanctions. Um, we've seen some cases now under GDPR, but I mean, it, it will be down to all of us to make sure the laws are enforced once they're in place. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I can say. I mean, you should have got in quicker with Commissioner King, but never mind. Uh, okay, so I think that there's a question for Emma, uh, sorry, for David Carroll, and then I'll give the other two speakers a, an opportunity to respond if they'd like to. So the, the question is, how could we say, um, uh, the, how, how could we imagine a world without f Facebook? Um, it's a provocative statement, um, but I think it's a statement that we need to make because so much of our assumptions are based on this idea that we cannot imagine a world without Facebook, and why is that? And um, the problem is, is that the intended goal of Facebook is to become a monopoly on top of the world. Um, it, its intended goal is to autocratically control the world's information and communication. Um, and so we have to ask if alternatives are possible and what would enable those. And we see the overlap between data protection and antitrust and monopoly are two sides of the same coin. And so I, I hope that New legislation in the United States will if more effectively curtail the abuse of concentrated power through data um, and potentially unlock the competitive marketplace again so that th through things like data portability, you, we could see migration of users on new platforms. Many people would like to quit Facebook. There's just nowhere to go. There's no competition. There's no more competition in this industry. So how could we unlock competition in the in industry and potentially privacy law 
data protection, data portability, and other things like that could help break it apart. Thank you. Thanks very much. Do either of the other speakers want to add something? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say something about a world without Facebook. I think it is perfectly possible to imagine social media networks that aren't based on the same principles as Facebook at all. Uh, the basic principle of Facebook is to make as much money as possible for its owners and investors. But uh, we have, for example, in uh, Wikimedia, Wikipedia is, is a shining example of a free kind of open source project. It makes reliable information available around the world to millions and millions of people and no one is making any money out of it but i think as professor carroll said facebook has from the beginning been about monopoly and it's very deliberately snapped up any uh, potential rivals to that monopoly whatsapp instagram its whole history is a monopolistic one and it's up to the regulators really to to stop that and it can be stopped. And I, one proposal in our report is that uh, fines and levies on uh, tech giants like Facebook, some portion of that should be put towards uh, public interest projects, such as developing more genuinely social media, uh, which could potentially replace Facebook. And as Professor Carroll said, there are many, many people, I think, who would welcome the chance to uh, be using a different kind of social media. People use Facebook because it's a genuinely useful utility. It has hundreds of uh, um, billions of users. It's easy to connect with people, but that's not to say that it can't be replaced by more attractively and genuinely social platforms. Thank you. I'm coming out for another question. I have to get Julie to ask another one. <laughs> Has anybody got anything they'd like to ask, or any speakers anything they'd like to add? Well, well, I would actually respond to the uh, comment about um, whether the uh, European Parliament solutions are likely to be leading us, uh, the rest of the world, to the f into the future here. I would certainly concur with that. From my engagements with the American in inquiries and um, uh, committees, um, they are very much looking to Europe, um, kind of surprisingly, actually, considering how American-centric America is, um, but uh, also um, in, in the UK as well. Um, and and I would say that um, you know anything that is that happens here is going to be setting a, a, a high high bar for those other uh, countries to respond to, and the ways in which um, uh, the European uh, Parliament also engages uh, more broadly around the world in developing you know practices and and um, uh, you know uh, relationships uh, which feed into wider international law and, and so forth is also going to be really really important and um, the um, EU really needs to take a, a lead on how we tackle this information I would argue um, the uh, problems with uh, tackling Facebook as well uh, responding to what Tom just said um, about new alternatives to Facebook. If we allow things like uh, data portability um, and the uh, um, setting up of alternative Facebooks where um, people are able to share their networks and their friends and so forth and, and, and take them with them to the other a, a competitive platform, then um, you know the data portability requires that we do the kinds of things that I was talking about, regulating the influence industry. Because you're, if you're making it possible to share that data, then you have to think about who you're sharing it with, and those uh, regulate that industry too, not just the platforms. So um, that was my final word. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So if uh, nobody has any other questions, I would like to float this idea, carrying on from the discussion we're having here about whether we can live without Facebook and whether we need to live without Facebook, because I'm an economist, so I'm interested in, in monopoly power and consolidation of markets. But my observation about Facebook is that it only makes sense to have one social network, right? You don't want to search through 10 to find the people you were at school with, should you wish to do such a thing. Um, and so that's why Facebook's there. That's why Facebook's so powerful, because it's potentially a way of connecting all the 
however many billion people there are on Earth, with each other through one platform, which is an amazing thing. But my feeling about that is it, it, it therefore belongs to us. It's, it's, it's beyond the kind of network, it's beyond the kind of monopoly that a railway is, where it only makes sense to have one railway track connecting one place or another, or water, where it only makes sense to have one set of pipes. It's actually the whole human race coming together into one community. How can that be owned by a private company? How can that be directed to make profits? And, um, of course, the other side of the same question is, who creates the value in Facebook? It's completely obvious that we do. I post a photo, you want to see my photo. You share a joke, somebody, you know, somebody else enjoys the joke. So everything that has value in Facebook is us. So effectively, the Facebook business model uses our creativity, privatizes it, turns it into profits for shareholders, and then uses that information to destroy the democracy that we depend on. How can you have something so powerful as that in the, pub, in the private sector? To me, that's just, that is the, the central question. So, I mean, what I try and think about is how we can move towards a system where we genuinely own Facebook and Facebook is socialised. And, you know, maybe we have to reward um, the people who came up with it, whether that was Zuckerberg or not, with that original bright idea in some university dorm. I mean, in my view, they've been rewarded many thousands of times over for that one simple bright idea. And the rest of Facebook should be ours. So anyway, um, that's my provocative thought for the morning. Feel free to respond. Emma. Thank you so much. And it definitely is provocative. It's quite exciting. Um, yes, I agree. Um, and the, but the, one of the, the points that people have made about that, about putting us in control of our data and the fact we actually produce and own this um, in a way, is uh, one suggestion has been made that we, um, we should be profiting from our own data or earning the money that is created from the data. One thing I would warn is that um, uh, this kind of uh, argument has been made in uh, ways that could be exploited for actually incentivizing people to give up more data. So that is one of the, the issues uh, that is raised in relation to um, the, the f possibilities of people earning money off their data and, and ownership of data. Um, it should be obviously being um, utilized for a general public good and not necessarily for people's own um, you know, profit or, or, or m uh, making money off their own data because that incentivizes people to give more of it away. Thank you. Thank you. Have I provoked anybody else in the room now? Hurrah. You two, one after the other. Hi, Olaf Bruins, Progressive Post. Um, I think many people could agree to this very appealing idea that Facebook should become a public utility. But the whole question is how to set up a way to go there. Because, I mean, the company is based in the United States. The United States are not very prone on nationalizing business at all anyway. And they don't have a very functional and very left-leaning government, left government quite now. So it, it's, it's just a it, – it seems a little bit of, of, a, of a dream we should all agree to. But how are we going to do that? Can I say something about that? Right, in, a minute, Tom, in a minute, Tom, I'm just going to the question at the back and then we'll answer them sure. together. Um, more of a comment than a question, I guess. Um, I totally agree with you that it should not be up to a single, a single company, a private company, to own the network of people, this, the social media platform. But I think there is often this misconception when you want to solve such a problem that we then want an alternative that we own. That is like the, the Wikimedia example of like, okay, there is one organization that then in a non-profit sense owns the social media. I think we really have to open our minds that, and see that you don't need a single organization to own a medium, to own a platform. A platform should just not be centralized. And I think we have plenty of examples, like who owns email? Nobody owns email. You can make an account at Google, uh, someone else makes an account at Microsoft. I run my own email server. And we can still communicate, right? There does not, there, there's no need for a single platform to be the platform. And the same with the internet. The same with banks. Like we have a different bank, we can send money to each other, we can have different phone providers, and we can call each other. 
Why do we need to be a member of Facebook in order to chat with each other? We need to regulate not so much what these companies are doing. We need not to set up an alternative platform. We need to regulate against the network lock-in effect that forces people to be a member of the same provider in order to communicate with each other. So I, I think my provocative question was useful because um, it has brought you forward and I think this is the crucial question. Is there something about Facebook that means there can only be one or not? My view is that, that there is. I would like to think you're right, but I see Facebook more as the, the payment system rather than the bank, right? But anyway, our experts can comment more on this. And your question to my mind, because I think I want to do this, is the most important one. How do we make this happen? So if anybody has any ideas about that or our speakers have, then please share them. But I know Tom wants to say something about this question. Yeah, just uh, one thing really about the way in which users are actually represented within a company like Facebook. Uh, we think they should have board level representation and that's actually something that Zuckerberg himself uh, said that he was going to do right back in 2009 when Facebook had run into uh, various difficulties with regulators. Uh, he promised that he would be introducing a user council which would be represented on the Facebook board. That never happened. Uh, like many of Facebook's promises, it's just been quietly forgotten. But I think that's an idea that should definitely be revived. Um, I think the point about Facebook being an American company governed by American corporate law is a very good one. It's clearly not going to be an easy job to nationalize Facebook uh, in the traditional way that people think about nationalization under American corporate law. But uh, I think it's quite possible to put considerable moral pressure on Facebook to uh, give some share of ownership to its actual users. And it's possible also that a, a social media code of practice could uh, stipulate that some form of ownership be uh, included for users of any social media platform. And that could be in the, show, the form of a share with voting rights, for example. If Facebook users were given each such a share, that would transfer an enormous amount of the value of Facebook, which, as Molly said, is actually created by users themselves for the main part. That would transfer a huge part of that to Facebook users themselves. Uh, there are many practical and technical challenges that it would present, but I think it's an idea worth exploring, and um, it's not impossible that it could happen. Any of our other speakers want to comment? No, I would just say, um, obviously, the value of Facebook, the value of all these companies whose uh, capital is basically virtual, um, is very variable, and they've increased hugely in value because they've effectively learned a way to exploit our creativity and our data. Um, but if we start controlling the, their ability to, to use, extract and sell our data, then presumably their value will fall. I hope so. And, and I, as I understand it, Facebook is currently under challenge from numerous legal cases as well, which presumably will also dent its value. So I'm, uh, I would like uh, to think that other people are working on this. Perhaps it's something I can do if we don't manage to stop Brexit. But I would... Uh, you know, there are a lot of users, and if we can dent the value sufficiently, maybe we could just buy it ourselves. Anyway, right, any more topics people would like to cover? Or questions or points for discussion? Yes. Hello. Um, my area of expertise is in uh, cyber around industrial control and automation. And I see the APIs as being the malevolent tools uh, that are used by uh, those forces that wish to manipulate the data on Facebook. So rather than looking at the platform, is there any crossover or learning that we could have from a very well-developed um, counter-intelligence uh, system for those uh, levels of threats that might be able to be applied to the APIs and uh, the companies developing those? 
Uh, yeah, I can respond a little bit to this. I, w I would say that there's a, a lot of effort. There's somebody, I can't remember their name, this is very bad, but Anglia Ruskin University in the UK who's been doing some work on algorithms and how they can be used to um, essentially monitor things like this. So look at the vulnerabilities and what's available and um, the effects that they're having and so on. Um, I would imagine that that's um, kind of the area that you need to be looking at in response to that, but I don't, I'm not an expert on it myself. But I would say that there's an awful lot of work being done on um, how algorithms can monitor the <laughs> algorithms and the vulnerabilities and so forth. Um, anybody else? David, maybe? I would just, um, another example of um, promises that Facebook has made but has yet to deliver is an API for political advertising. So right now it's an interface that you can manually look through, uh, but it is not yet available for machine analysis. Um, so that that's an example of where civil society and other private enterprise what's going on in, in Facebook regarding political advertising in, at scale through the APIs, but it's just not delivered yet. Um, and in, and in one, one way, Twitter's, you know, the fact that it has an API means it has been ripe for abuse and has played a particular role in the disinformation ecosystem that t Twitter plays a different function than Facebook and YouTube do. Uh, it is particular for influencing the influencers and sh shaping the media discourse and doing the initial seeding. Uh, but it's really not where the uh, delivery of it, of the disinformation occurs. And like I mentioned in, in my remarks, researchers at the University of Iowa have been developing algorithms to monitor how the companies are enforcing their own policies. And I think if academics and civil society can put more pressure on the companies to prove exactly how they're failing to enforce their own policies, uh, that this is a very important way that we can pressure the companies to challenge their own claims that they've got this under control. Uh, they do not. Thank you very much. So last chance for questions to our experts. Yes. Uh, I have a question for you. It's a little bit the same question I had before to Commissioner King, but I, I think the awareness is really there in the UK because of the Brexit referendum. I don't have the impression that in the rest of the, of the member states there is enough awareness right now. Um, what, is your, what is your experience that you're having here in the European, European Parliament? Do you, do you feel that there is enough awareness among uh, MEPs to really to, to, to tackle the issue, to think about it, what is happening? We called a topical debate at one of our Strasbourg sessions on um, Cambridge Analytica and, uh, yeah, and SCL. And I would say probably about Six, let's say 60 MEPs spoke and 10 of them understood what was going on and yeah um, and I think in Britain some of us that lived through the Brexit referendum knew something really weird was going on um, just because of the way particularly in my case because of the way people were enraged they would come at you in a public meeting uh, accusing you of all sorts of extremely specific things you'd done to betray your country. And I know people don't have that much information about what an MEP does. So, um, you know, so they'd, they'd been sent information that I was working on some law that would allow jihadis to come in and kill their children or something like this, and they were furious, furious with me. And this is completely new. So it was more the psychological response of um, the electorate that alerted me to something going on. And then my daughter, being a lot more savvy, told me precisely what um, SCL had been doing, which she'd just worked out for herself because she'd had her information hacked by filling in a questionnaire. So that was how I was alerted to it. And I think because, yeah, because Brexit was done to us, you know, it, it's an operation that's destroying Britain, um, we did become aware of this. But I say we, I would still say it's a very small minority. What, why aren't the people of Britain up in arms refusing to let Brexit go ahead? You know, I mean, Julie, hurrah, did that. But, uh, 
We're, we're a small minority, even in Britain, and I think this is the problem with it being too big and too techy. And so that's why we're trying to break it down in this report. In, probably until you've been subject to one of these operations, you, you probably actually just don't understand what's going on, and probably you, you, look, you look elsewhere and you just um, find it hard to believe that could happen. And I would find it hard to believe that would happen if I hadn't experienced it. And uh, sometimes I'm so uh, cynical that I wonder whether the whole idea of a conspiracy theory wasn't invented for just this moment. <laughs> because it's perfect, isn't it? You can say, look at that, look at that conspiracy theorist over there. But it's a conspiracy fact. We can see who the players are, we can see where the money went. You know, we've got the evidence here. Um, and this is what's so frightening about it, that um, so many people just dismiss it. And we're proceeding, you know, um, Brazil is proceeding with trashing the Amazon. The U.S. is proceeding with all sorts of foreign policy insanity. We're proceeding with Brexit, the most destructive thing we've ever done to our country. All influenced by this kind of operation, um, paid for by very wealthy people, completely lacking in transparency. Um, and that's why I'm doing this. And that's why it's the most important thing I'm doing. And that's why I'm surprised, you know, we don't have a crowd of people outside the door wanting to be in here. But I think... All I would say is repeating my request that you, you share this information. Please try and share the report. I think we all need to individually commit to defending democracy. That's the situation we've got to now. I do everything I can. There's a very good book called On Tyranny by Timothy Snyder, which is wider than this social media discussion, but it's very clear about how authoritarianism is um, supported and what you can do to challenge it. And I made a resolution like last Christmas, the one before the one just gone, uh, where I basically challenge all examples I see of attacks on democracy and I think everybody that can do that you know democracy is ours we have to defend it anyway I've made so many kind of speeches from here and I'm not supposed to do that I'm the chair so but it's just because you're not asking the questions right Julie's going to do the same thing go for it Julie um well first of all I just wanted to pay tribute to um academic experts and journalists um you know, and during the Brexit referendum campaign, we also had this thing about, oh, well, we don't, you know, we've had enough of experts. We don't want to listen to any more experts. But actually, thank goodness for you, Tom and David, you know, who are doing um, extraordinary things. And I'm coming to Emma, OK? Emma and I actually met in a very interesting situation. We met on Twitter. I happened to be in a car with Nigel Farage, and he was on the phone. I wasn't speaking to him, don't worry, right? <laughs> I was forced to be in a car with him for 90 minutes when the Parliament um, chauffeured me from Basel Airport to Strasbourg. I, in fact, I thought about hitchhiking. I couldn't bear the thought of being in the car with him. <laughs> But I did get in the car, and he was, on, he was sitting in front of me. I was sitting in the back, and he's on his phone the whole time. And it was April last year, and he was having a huge um, rant at his PR people because the um, precise information that Emma has just shared with you today about how their propaganda machine um, um, praised the Nazi propaganda machine had become a news story. And he was on his phone going, who's this Emma Bryant? Who's this Emma Bryant? And I actually thought, I'll do a little, I'll do a little Google. And I discovered that Emma and I were following each other on Twitter. So I've just looked at it again. So I sent a message. I went, Emma, I'm in the car with Nigel Farage, OK? He's going bonkers because, you know, you've exposed him in public. So I just want to say some, you know, I really wanted just to pay tribute, actually. And Emma crosses both those both those worlds. She's working in journalism, but she's working in journalism as an academic researcher. And I think that we have to really um, give space and support, enormous support, to people like you. We're under attack as politicians. And in a way, when you put your head above the parapet and you agree to stand as a politician, you kind of expect that that comes with the territory. But I don't think journalists expect that. And there's a wider issue about the attacks on journalists um, in our, in our democracies, witness all the journalists who are imprisoned in Turkey, witness what happened to Daphne, Caruana uh, Galithia, the two journalists in Slovakia. The list goes on. Okay? So I just want to really pay tribute to the work that you're doing, that Carol Cadwallader is doing, that um, Adam, is it Adam Payne, um, democracy, uh, an open democracy? Yeah? There's some extraordinary people um, who've not allowed the complexity 
possibility of this, to defeat them um, and to try and feed it to the public in bite-sized chunks. And I think you know, your report, Molly, does, does that again, you know, is another helpful addition to that. Um, I, I think that I don't I think that we are going to continue to be very challenged by this, actually, those of us who care about democracy. Um, uh, I think it's going to continue to challenge us enormously. Um, and I'm glad that Molly said what she said in response to your um, suggestion that we in Britain know all about it. Well, no, actually, the British people are still being fed loads of rubbish, OK? And Facebook is part of that. Um, not just Facebook, but many people are still part of this. Um, uh, you know, Brexit is a right-wing fascist coup, folks, um, and it's basically being headed up by a load of grumpy old white men. That's where it's coming from. Thank you, Julie. That's a nice place to end. Not the fascist white men, obviously, but uh, the, uh, the tribute to the researchers three of whom we've got here with us today and the excellent work that's, that's been done by, by academics and the journalists who are digging into this. So in closing, I always like to close on a positive note and the positive note is that we can deal with this. As a human community, we can deal with this. Um, I think of it as a parallel to what happened with the Industrial Revolution. When people left the land, they went into cities, they had to take this wage slavery relationship, they lost their social communities, they fell out of the church. All of these terrible things that happened, people were completely socially dislocated and disempowered. But over time, we developed the networks and the power structures and the, the laws, in fact, that we needed to, to reinforce our power, and life improved. And I just feel we're at the kind of first stage of the Industrial Revolution, and we're a bit bewildered and we're, we're learning. But I have every confidence that, that we have the... We have the uh, ingenuity and the strength to, to make the regulations and to change the laws so that social media can be the amazing thing that it has the potential to be, and has been, actually. Uh, if we think today we've got these two guys joining us, one from New York and one from lovely Cornwall, and uh, you know, the, the amazing opportunities that our networked world offers us are there, and we're enjoying them, and we just have to constrain the, the darker aspects. Um, and just on a lighter note, um, something is changing because we tried to send out... I, I'm, I've done a, just done a road show on how to fight fascism in your local community, which was actually a lot more fun than it sounds. Um, and uh, we tried to put some adverts about that out on Facebook, and they told us we weren't registered as a political campaign. So it was somewhat ironic, but it does show that something's changing. So thank you once again to all our speakers, and thank you for being here. And please do what you can to share the word and to defend democracy. Thank you. Thanks, Billy.